Bonsoir euh, Tatiana Bilbao, je suis très, très honoré et très heureux de, de vous accueillir euh, à l'école ce soir, surtout que j'ai su que vous étiez en compétition cet après-midi, donc euh, <rire> ça doit être un peu difficile, mais ce soir l'Assemblée est, est euh, d'un ordre tout à fait différent et très convivial. Euh, vous êtes donc une, une architecte maintenant très connue au niveau international. Euh, Dominique Coulon va va parler de, 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 votre, de votre activité et de votre architecture. Simplement, j'ai à rappeler simplement qu'en 2002, je crois, vous aviez été euh, sur le devant de la scène avec une commande de Ai Weiwei en Chine pour un, un pavillon dans, dans un parc. Donc, c'est une architecture expérimentale de, de, sous forme de pavillon. Souvent, l'architecture commence un peu comme ça par des, 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 des petites fabriques dans un parc et puis petit à petit, on, on, on devient de plus en plus connu. Et, et vous avez eu aussi le Global Award of Sustainable Architecture euh, en 2014, je crois, euh, qui est une distinction très, très importante aujourd'hui et, et qui était présentée à la Cité de l'Architecture et du, et du Patrimoine euh, à Paris, donc à, à la CAPA. Voilà, donc je vais laisser... Euh, Dominique, vous présentez plus en détail et encore merci pour votre présence ce soir. Merci, je vais essayer d'être bref. Enfin, je vais être bref. Euh, donc moi aussi, je suis très heureux que, que tu sois là. Et je dirais que ce qui caractérise ton architecture, c'est qu'elle est à la fois à la fois locale et à la fois internationale. Et c'est ce que je trouve très intéressant. Et en même temps, ce que je trouve aussi intéressant, c'est que tu es très libre, en fait, dans la fabrication de tes projets. Et euh, il y a, ça se verra, ça se verra, parce que ils sont aussi assez différents, mais tu es libre dans la façon de les construire, dans les façons de les dessiner. Et il y a une grande poésie dans ta production. Donc, euh, je suis très content que la salle soit pleine pour, euh, pour voir ton travail. Et, et voilà, je, donc, euh, je te donne la parole. Merci. Merci. Merci à tous. Merci à tous pour être ici. Et je suis très, très heureuse d'être ici avec vous ce soir. Et pour moi, mon français, c'est un petit peu limité. Alors, je, je bien comprends tout, mais je préférais de parler en anglais. Si. Je m'excuse, je voudrais continuer en français, mais le, mon français n'est pas très, <rire> très ex extense. Um, pas encore. Je, je pense que peut-être, <rire> si, les, les, si on gagnait les concours, <rire> peut-être que je pourrais parler mieux après. Um, so, um, I wanted to, tonight to... Um, to really create a presentation that would at least lead you to understand the ethos or uh, the, the motives that um, our architecture pursues. And I think that um, uh, within these few projects that I'm going to show, uh, I would like to, to really go um, quickly to show you uh, uh, obviously a vision on the, on the work we do, but basically um, What, it, what moves us to do architecture, how, how we approach it, and what we think. And basically, um, one of the, the, the biggest um, issues uh, or uh, understandings of uh, the way we do architecture is that for me, architecture is collective. It's a collective act. Uh, that really needs to be thought collecti collectively, as it's going to be used collectively. But not also that. I think that uh, um, if you think that architecture, uh, it's only there, and I believe actually that when it's occupied, then it's definitely at least a problem of two. The person who poses the architecture or who poses the space and the person who uses it. So I think definitely the social interaction that architecture really needs uh, and to, to, become, to become what it is, what it's necessary of, uh, it, need, it needs to be conceived the same way. So therefore, I truly believe in collaborations. I, I believe that uh, when architecture is conceived with more than one mind, it's truly responding to, to a more collective um, uh, thinking. But also because I truly think that um, uh, we have to build 
for people. We don't have to, sorry, we, don't, we should not build for people, we should build with people. And with this I mean that at some point we have to try to become that people. It's not possible in the principle of Levinas, you know, that uh, alterity uh, is, plays an important role in life and in order to understand it. It's not possible to become the other, but it is possible to act uh, towards that. In this case, if you do it collectively, I believe that it's totally more um, capable or more possible because you are able to understand it better. So um, this project uh, is, a, is a pilgrimage route that exists uh, for almost 300 years, 200 and something. Uh, it's a pilgrimage done, um, it's a Catholic pilgrimage done in a... Um, in a part of the country, in Mexico, in the central part of the country, uh, that it's venerating a virgin of rosary, um, that more than two, uh, three million pilgrims every, every year do it, uh, since very long, as I said. And basically, they, year by year, have been, uh, like, doing little infrastructure for the, for the pilgrimage because there's none. It's, it's also supported by the people of the town. The people of the town normally give the services that they're not. Uh, or the pilgrims themselves, they build uh, little or sanctuaries or places for, to rest in the middle of the mountains through the pilgrimage. Also, all these towns around this pilgrimage, they, their economy lives because of the pilgrimage, because of what happens every, most, mostly it happens during Holy Week, which is um, uh, in the first uh, three months of the year. And mostly it happens during that time where all, all the people go. So the rest of the year, nothing happens in these little towns. And the, therefore, they depend uh, economically because of it. The route really passes um, several different types of landscape, as it's uh, 150 kilometers, more or less, uh, all along. Uh, depends where you join, because definitely this is not a specific route. Obviously, it's a route that uh, pilgrims trace. And uh, we were invited to create these points of reference along the route, uh, also to think on infrastructure, little infrastructure, and to also think a little bit on how we could also pursue a development for this um, uh, for this route to get more more important, uh, also economically for the towns. So we decided. I decided to invite a Mexican architect, Derek Delecam, to join me and uh, to collaborate to uh, create a master plan. And then together we decided to invite a series of uh, friends. They needed to be friends because they needed to trust us to, to, to do this project, which at the beginning sounded a little bit crazy, um, in order to collaborate with us to to really think that uh, we could do something really incredibly local, but for a project that would really impact these people. So we needed a really broad uh, way of thinking, and we wanted to invite people from all over. We invited people really local, like Luis Aldrete, uh, who's an architect from that region, but also we invited people as um, far as, and, and probably as country in our way of thinking as Ai Weiwei from China. Um, also, we invited our dear friends from HHF who teach here, and um, and another uh, architects from Basel, Christian Gassenberg. And what we did is we created a master plan uh, of uh, the possibilities that the route would give us, the relationship with the little towns around it, and uh, the logic of and the rhythm that we thought it was interesting. We invited all the architects to the pilgrimage. We didn't do exactly the full 150 kilometers, but we did some. And then we decided who would do what very democratically. And we created, like as I said, a rhythm of different uh, moments or actions that would uh, enhance the, the pilgrimage, would also mark nodes, routes, stops, and moments. And um, the first, uh, the first, um, the, the first point do you encounter in the route uh, was done by us, by me and Derek Telecam, the other Mexican architect, and we decided to take the most important symbol for Catholic. Uh, 
religion, and this is a cross. And we decided to do a very simple gesture of doing an open chapel that with only four walls, obviously doing um, an homage to Matthias Geris, if you know his work, uh, of pu pulling up these walls and creating an open chapel that could serve for many purposes. First of all, could serve as a chapel for this little town. Secondly, could serve as a point of reunion for many pilgrims and would also be part of the landscape and, and, a, first, and, a, and a point where, of reference. So you really see it from afar. From this side, you see the next one. On the next one, you see this one. And it's a point of, uh, in a way, of reunion that um, it reunites many of the pilgrims to start this journey. Also, we wanted it to become um, a place where you could put uh, physically in the walls your, your wishes or your, um, your, uh, your yeah your wishes for for the for the journey or for the or what why you are pilgriming to to this um, uh, virgin. The next point was done by uh, Chris and Gantenbein from Basel, and they uh, they also marked uh, at the point the highest point in in at this at this point and this in this part of the route. Um, it's not only a marker; it's a column certainly. But it is also a space, uh, a, an internal space, that allows you a, a little bit to lift the spirit, to think, to retreat. So it's an exposed uh, structure, but also allows this individuality through this internal space uh, of the column. The next point you encounter, which you don't see it from, a far, from far, and this is also a very nice rhythm, that you, some of them you see them, some of them you refer to, and some of them just find them on the way, is uh, Ai Weiwei's um, structure, which the intention was to become uh, this, this path that takes you and exposes you to the landscape, but also that brings you into the earth, uh, to a little bit play with this duality of exteriority and interiority. Obviously, now it's named the Chinese wall, and, and you might know why <laughs> in the local language. And in the way in between, we decided to understand that uh, the shelters would be attached to uh, the little towns, because the shelters could play an interesting role of becoming also community centers. So, as I said, this route plays like a important, like the people play an important role around uh, Holy Week. It depends maybe, sometimes it's 40 days that there's people around it, but then the rest of the year this is empty. So we thought these, these, um, uh, these spaces could be attached to these little towns in, in a way to serve as different purposes. So they're multifunctional rooms. They don't have a specific um, definition. So it's, they serve as shelters during the, during the, during the pilgrimage time, but if not, they serve as uh, places for parties, political reunions, different things that really the, these little towns are lacking of services of these types. The next point you encounter in the route is this um, beautiful structure done by HHF, and I'm not saying beautiful because they're here, but I really think so, because it's a, it's a beautiful uh, structure that just folds in, in itself and brings you up to the, to the top of the structure and allows you to have a really incredible relationship with the landscape. So you have a relationship with the structure and then you have a relationship to the landscape, bringing in this way the pilgrims to to, to have a, just a relaxing moment, no? I also think that it's great because these little kids that live around uh, really have take, taken over the structure and it's only like their playground. Um, from this one you walk and you go uphill and you go to the highest point of the route, which there's a structure from Alejandro Aravena who did uh, just this gesture of um, creating a very um, concrete and possibly urban-like structure that falls with the landscapes, falls with the topography, and interiorly creates this uh, uh, duality of uh, seeming a very urban space, could be like the underground of a, of a passage in, in any city, 
But and then you uh, realize you are really in the top of the mountain, so you ex were exposed totally to the landscape. You were br brought back to the mountains. And then you continue to go down to almost uh, uh, descending to the, to the, to the uh, um, cathedral of the Spirting in, in Talpa, in a little town. And in the way you encounter this last structure, which is a circle that just encircles the landscape, and that uh, that allows you to uh, do a stop in the way, have a reflection moment, have a moment of also collectively uh, with your family or with your friends, have a, a stop and a and a prayer before you go and end up in the in the church. So in a way, the the. Um, the way the rhythm that the structures take you is almost pro probably non-important, but for the for the pilgrims, the the insertion of these structures really set up a point of um, of presence uh, of importance that was really really good for them. So we actually didn't understood the project until the project was completely done. You know, we architects think we can understand things uh, in, a, in a paper and in, and in a plan, but I don't think we do, <laughs> literally. And in this case, in this project was even less. We really couldn't understand a thing uh, of this ritual because we, none of us, we have done it, but even if we have done it, this really the interaction of the structures with the landscape and with the, uh, and with the ritual. Uh, has 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 really taken its place more organically, and this is something that I think architecture needs. No, architecture cannot be predicted and cannot be directed. So you you should allow architecture to to be what it 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 will be, and that's how I think uh, we do architecture. No, in in this project in in the botanical garden, there are many many things that led us to understand that architecture could only just be uh, uh, a facilitator of things, but nothing else. No, and I, and that sometimes we as architects think architecture could be everything, but I don't think architecture could solve nothing. Just be facilitators of many things. Definitely be facilitator of better life, better places. And that's what, uh, in this case, we intended to do. So we arrived in uh, 15 years ago to this garden, which was in a state of uh, incredible... Um, how to say, like in my mind as architect, when I arrived, I said, oh my God, this is in total despair. This is garden needs to be really... Um, uh, fixed, and it really needs to see it. And I think that when we arrived there, this garden was flourishing, was completely rich of life, and that needed very little. And I understood that only years later, but fortunately before we started the intervention. Um, the garden is used not only for educational purposes, it's a really important place for, le for leisure, for uh, recreation, and it's, uh, it already had a very uh, eclectic collection of art. Uh, and uh, our purpose of in, uh, intervening this garden, which is almost in the middle of the city, uh, that depends definitely in this uh, neighborhood connection and in this urban tissues totally embedded in this tissue, was to really understand the role it played. No, so it really it is a public space it's it's free it's public so almost the botanical part is secondary although it's not because it's its main purpose so we really needed to encourage this purpose we needed to integrate the new program the client wanted the president of the board that take her, takes care of this garden wanted to introduce a very um, uh, a very ambitious collection of contemporary art uh, and we needed to connect these points. We needed to understand how to intersect this collection that is totally uh, foreign to the landscape, to the language, to the people, uh, but not breaking really the relationships that were already there in the garden. No? So, um, as I said, like our first approach was to think uh, uh, that the, well, not was to think, we thought that this garden was really 
completely disorganized. And my first idea was we need to create a system that organizes these completely. No? Um, we understood that this garden also is a, a very important uh, identity part for the society. So girls, for example, in Mexico when they turn 15 years old, it's a very important day. Girls dress up like princes and they take their photos, uh, the photographs of that day, they're forever. You know? It's like the wedding uh, or these 15 days is very important. 15 years old is very important. And they, um, so they really take their pictures in this in these garden and that's a sign definitely that uh, that we that the garden is super important for the place, no? So um, when we thought of intervening this place, which, as uh, I said, is also for sports, rest, we started thinking on how we could enhance those things. And we went back and forth to the garden. This garden is in Culiacán, which is a city in the north of the country, northwest. And the thing is also it has a very specific uh, problematic, this city, which this city is embedded in the <coughs> most important region, sorry, <coughs> for drug dealers, and the, <laughs> the most important <coughs> lords of the drugs are from this city. The biggest cartel of drugs is in this city. So this city, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> this city is really, um, in our minds, in our minds in, as Mexicans, this city really is like the capital of the drugs. So we needed to overcome that because definitely this garden has nothing to do with it. And all the program that was intended to become there also had nothing to happen there, no? <coughs> So we were thinking, as I said, like my, with the architect's mind, that we need to organize everything, and we think we know everything, and we think we, are, we have the correct solution for every space in the world. Um, this is how I came there, and I said, uh, and we were talking, and we were walking, and one day I, um, I was just saying that I had a brilliant idea that we were going to do like this yoga pavilion, and we were doing going to do this beautiful yoga pavilion in the middle of the garden because in this garden people do yoga, tai chi, and it's perfect. And then this gardener looked to me with a funny face and said, yoga pavilion. And, and I thought he didn't understand what yoga meant, yoga meant. And I said, yeah, yoga, these people make yoga. You see these people are doing yoga. And he said, yeah, of course, but why would you want to make a pavilion? So I just didn't pay attention, and then the days passed, and I thought, why would he be so um, uh, aseptic about it if it's a great idea? And then I realized that if we would have done a yoga place, we really would have killed the activity, because we would completely have a space that would direct the activity instead of it happening spontaneously in the garden. So we would have to uh, create a program, a schedule, um, maybe the professor would start charging for it, and then we would really have created a conflict, and people who just go in there and do this very intuitively at any time of the day would just stop doing it. So when I understood that, I understood that we really couldn't do an intervention that would impose nothing because the garden had already an incredible activity. So I thought that the best thing would be to, for me, in my mind, so I, I needed an order, you know, like we architects in our minds, we need order. So I needed an order to direct things, to direct the intervention, but not directly to, to impose nothing. So we created a plan that would allow us to understand where we could do the interventions and how we did it is we traced the branches of a tree, the Wanacasle, which they really looked like the, the plan that it was in the garden and which at some point they allow us to create a system at least that would allow us to integrate the program into the garden. So we, we just opened it and placed it into the... Um, uh, into the garden, and we did a master plan. And with this, we have been intervening this garden through the years. So as I said, we've been working for 15 years in this garden, and our moves have been really concrete, very specific, very small, 
And the first um, idea is that we really think that this garden has a very diverse collection of plants and that we needed first to understand those collections, even though they're totally spread out, they're totally um, uh, not classified, we really needed to understand what was the, the, the species there, what were the ecosystems, in order just to act in very small ways. So how, for example, we created this uh, bridge in the middle that just connects the two um, uh, palm collections, or the, the palm collection, it, the, really the passage connects you through, to, so you're able to see it better. Then the, um, uh, we did this pond in the middle of the bamboo area because in this way we could understand, uh, we could enhance the, the ecosystem way better. Um, understanding that the palm collection is the most important but also how to really promote the, the bamboo collection because it's really important. We thought that introducing these very small spaces of discovering, for example, the water or the collection or the um, moments of rest or introducing these hammocks to really um, allow people to stay longer in a, in a comfortable space or only to protect the collection to allow these activities to really happen uh, completely free and totally uh, spontaneously. And um, we just uh, uh, decided to uh, open the irrigation system so people could really see uh, how this garden is irrigated because before you couldn't see it. Uh, and I think it's really interesting because it's completely done by gravity and manually. So it was interesting also to think how were little things that we could do that could just enhance the visit, like opening a passage uh, in, uh, in parts where the, the, there was no passages or introducing some species to enhance, other, uh, uh, to enhance the collection. And the art did the same. So as I said, the purpose was to create a very um, ambitious, to put in a very ambitious uh, art collection. And what we, um, uh, we didn't say anything to the artist. The, the curator, Patrick Charpenel, also didn't even say anything. We just uh, invite the artist to the garden and we just left them to, to decide where and what they would do. This is an art piece by Aloran Calzadilla. It's a couple of American artists uh, from the United States that, um, the, that they used to do like more performance-like activities. And definitely we realized that um, by doing this, we were able to introduce contemporary art to this society. This society is really not in contact with contemporary art. Contemporary art is totally foreign. Actually, art is totally foreign to this community. Um, in Mexico, normally art is not part of your cult of our culture, is not part of what we grow up with. We don't have extensive museums, especially in DC, there's no museums. There's one very small one with no collection. So art is kind of foreign. So we really realized that if we wanted to create this ambitious uh, collection and put it with the same budget into a white box, perfectly white, uh, perfectly built museum, white box museum, with the perfect conditions, people would not, never have entered. Versus in this garden, people are really encouraged to go, to interact with art, to uh, art become part of the day, uh, or even art that, like this piece from Dan Graham to become part of their uh, important moments of life. No? So I think that art in this place has been able to open a discussion, which normally has to do, but in, in, in Europe it's in museums, in Mexico this is nowhere. So in this park really the connection is really direct because you're here spending your life, your everyday life, and what, meanwhile, you are really connecting with art and understanding what art can give you. No? This piece by Francis Salis, who's a Belgian artist living in Mexico for long, uh, that crashed his uh, beetle in, in this garden, really obviously created a lot of um, things the first time this beetle was there, like what the hell this drunk guy was doing in our garden, because people call it our garden, it's their garden. 
uh, but also like also introducing art to these people that have never imagined that art could have these possibilities, no? Um, the the or for example, this small pavilion done by um, Olafur Eliasson, who really did a, a piece that very subtle uh, tells you that the stations exist, no? That. Uh, uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter happen. Although in this in this place, people think that it doesn't happen because it's really very hot through the year. But with a very simple gesture of using a plant, a native plant that changes through the season, you really understand that the seasons do exist. Or, for example, this piece of art that formerly was in a plaza in New York, totally intact, totally unused, uh, in the garden becomes really this leisure area. This is a piece by Richard Long, no? Or a, a very controversial piece from an artist, local artist named Teresa Margoyes, who did these benches very comfortable where these ladies normally every day sit after they run in the garden. But then they realized that the, the, piece, the benches were done with the water that were used to wash dead bodies by the, or assassin people by the drug dealers. And this is a little bit a uh, piece that really incites society to think that we're resting on this problem and that we're not doing nothing. And but when these ladies find that found out that this was the technique that these ventures were done, and they were done, I was there, so I saw it literally. Um, they were really outraged. They called the media, they called the government, they almost were standing protesting in the front of the, the gate of the garden, not letting people in. And then the garden decided to invite the artists to the garden. And now these ladies are the biggest promoters of the garden. So this is also something that art is doing in this garden, that definitely the conception of a museum breaks in this case and totally uh, integrates into a, a life, an everyday life, that allows people to, to really understand art better in a place, in a society where art is not part of the, of the game, let's say. Um, this is a piece by uh, another artist, Marco Rampi, or Roman Ondak, or Valesca Suarez. So art is uh, um, it's playing a role, a physical role, a very important physical role in the place, but also intellectual role, by creating all these questions. This is a pavilion by James Turrell, um, who uh, did this very impressive work uh, there. Or, for example, all the water faucets that were done by Atelier Van Lisout. So uh, the garden and, uh, and the, the main purpose uh, is always to be a botanical garden. So we said, okay, we're introducing this very important but, uh, art, contemporary art collection. We really need to uh, encourage and enhance the, the botanical part. And we decided to think that architecture could promote that by spreading in the whole garden and not creating one single gesture of a big building that would probably hold all the program. That could sound practical, but then it's really destructive for the purpose of really reminding everybody that this is a botanical garden, no? So uh, the first uh, structure that we did was an, uh, an auditorium, and this is an auditorium that the client asked us a room with air conditioning that could show a video of seven minutes, an introduction for the people that would walk in the garden. And we thought, what a crazy idea to think that in a garden, in a botanical garden, you're going to go into a room to see a movie. So we just did a very simple gesture of doing three walls that are folded and that they really create these spaces that the client needed, a space to watch this seven minute video, a space of for waiting for the next group to enter the place, and a space that would really even be used for many other things, not only for leisure activities, but also this has been a place for lectures and uh, other like cycles of, um, of movies, of showing movies or anything. The second uh, area we developed was an area that we called um, educational services. And here, uh, the concept uh, is very clear, where we really wanted to, to explore the, explode the program and create these pavilions that would only hold one program, the most uh, reduced idea of it, in order to function, obviously, 
but to allow you always to, and remind you always that you are in a botanical garden. So these two buildings are a room, educational room, an auditorium, and then the services, which are also in a different building, uh, bathrooms and janitory services, etc. So what we did structurally is that this is one gesture, is one shell, one uh, concrete shell that falls into itself, 30 centimeters thick, and that our weather allows us to do that. I'm sorry that here you cannot, but we can. Um, and that creates the space. So it has no structure internally, so we decided to design this to allow this space to really become one thing. But also, as I said, we broke the, the, the program, so in every space you are, you are reminded that you are in a botanical garden, but also if you need to use another space, you need to go out, and if it's raining, you get wet, it doesn't rain that much, but if it's hot, you, you get hot, and if, uh, and if there's a bird singing, you hear it, but if also you can see the plants moving. So for us, it was really important that architecture really promotes the, the possibility of you being outside, which in this city is kind of, uh, because people like to be in, in air conditioning spaces, no? Also, art was, um, also artists, some artists wanted to relate with architecture, such as this one, which is an artist called Tercer Un Quinto, and they decided to bury the ruins of a little hut that was there before our buildings arrived, and this to create also a ludic space for, for kids. Um, we also wanted the strategy of these buildings to be one thing, to have one material, concrete, basically, to, um, to become everything, no? So the concrete is the structural definition, the aesthetic definition, the aesthetic final definition, the insulation, the acoustics protection, so everything is in this shell, which is concrete. And we also wanted these to be concrete because we wanted nature to become <coughs> rejected but, uh, but accepted at some point and that also would um, really eat <coughs> I'm sorry <coughs> these buildings more same strategy as I said we started these buildings we started this project 15 years ago and through the year uh, the years our architecture has changed we see architecture that doesn't need all this kind of complexity in the gestures of geometrical complexity in gestures. We, we understood through the years that uh, geometry gives us an incredible opportunity to create architecture that is powerful, that it's simple, that it's direct. Uh, so by using the, so that we understood through the years. So here you see two epochs of our, um, uh, our architecture, and uh, so the, the the second set of buildings we do them we we design them like eight years after, but using the same strategies of the beginning, we thought they were really um, powerful, and we wanted to break the program into pieces. We decided to break it in the le in the most possible way pos uh, feasible functional, and we created these pavilions that are related to each other, but again, remind you always that you're in a botanical garden. In this case, we needed to use a different type of material because we needed to use a material that would be cheaper, uh, but we also wanted to use a material that would allow us to become everything, become the structure, the aesthetic final definition, the insulation, uh, and the acoustic insulation. So we decided to use brick, concrete brick in this case. The, the uh, concrete brick is um, reinforced with steel bars in, in between and with uh, a little bit of co poured concrete inside, so we could use it as everything. And uh, this way we could follow our strategy, but we also could create a, a cheaper building uh, and an easier way of, of building it. This building is a, a storage, uh, a, a dining room for employees, uh, but also has a relationship with art. This is a piece by Pedro Reyes. Um, and this really, this building also has a laboratory and a, and a air, airvarium, no? The next building that was built after that one, but was designed 
in the first phase is the north entrance and the north entrance has uh, the offices and the stores and there's only a, a, an element added, same strategy, same materials, an element added which is uh, shadows, these uh, umbrellas we call them, which create shadow and protection from the weather in the entrance point. So you can wait for people, buy your tickets or buy things in the store, uh, but you're protected from the, from the conditions of the weather. Um, so the, the general idea in this garden is really to understand how to act uh, versus nature, how to think uh, in a social place like this that has a, such an important identity for the town, and how to understand that architecture, as I said, could promote or could even not promote the, 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 these interactions or could really uh, limit these interactions with, with nature, with people, with society, uh, or with art in this case. No? By, in a way, um, uh, colonizing a landscape, uh, because I think architecture colonizes, definitely, in a way, uh, we create a relationship that could dialogue or that could completely stop the dialogue. No, so I think that the the next project, uh, which was a competition uh, that we didn't want for a very interesting building, that it's a pyramid uh, done by Diego Rivera and Juan O'Gorman. Diego Rivera is a very important artist from the beginning of last century, and uh, he's a muralist. For those who you don't know his work, and he's really impacted the intellectual life in Mexico through the past century. And he teamed up with Juan O'Gorman, who was also a very important architect that influenced a lot uh, the way modernism was translated into Mexican words, for us to say it. And we were invited to this competition to understand how we could do a more program for it. So this is a museum built by Diego Rivera to hold his collection of pre-Columbian art. And they needed more spaces. And they have a very interesting landscape which is totally invaded. And the same strategy we applied, we decided that we wanted to open uh, the structures into the landscape. And instead of really being in positive to the building, the existing important building, we thought we wanted to spread those structures by only having a specific small presence in the main plaza for the building, but extending these uh, structures towards the landscape, interacting with the landscape, and by using the landscape, appropriating the landscape. No? A move that we did in the Botanical Garden at work, and a move that we thought uh, it really worked in this house. No? In this house, the client wanted us to do um, uh, a house that could uh, enhance her relationship to the forest, but completely ban the mosquitoes, the insects, the animals from her uh, from her life. No, so it was a contradiction from itself. So we decided to create a contradictory building that has a complete, um, completely reflective surface that rejects totally the nature, so this was a conflict because she first said, I want to have a house embedded in the forest with nature, but she really didn't want it that. So we created this contradiction as well of a building that rejects completely the nature by reflecting it, but spreads out in three different, build in three different small pavilions. So there's a main pavilion, uh, two rooms, there are three structures, so we decided to use three materials, and for the main house we used as a main material the glass. Uh, the secondary material, a brick that we develop um, uh, specifically for this house, and a tertiary material, the wood. The glass, as I said, that rejects the nature, uh, but in a way in the interior also play, allows you to be part of the nature by reflecting you into the nature. So the, the reflection takes you there. The materiality falls uh, again from the exterior to the interior and creates this screen as well. And as I say, the tertiary material is the wood that protects you from the light of the, of the direct light of the, of the rooftop. The second pavilion, the idea was to use an, 
one of the other three materials to become everything, to become the primary material, which is the brick. So we use the brick for the walls structurally. We use the wood as a secondary material to create the interior spaces. And we use the, the glass to just separate you from, from nature. No? So in a way, we decided to use the materials uh, primarily in one of the pavilion each and then using the, those materials in those three pavilions differently. No? Uh, the, the, the third pavilion, which is a pavilion done in wood, is not yet built. It's going to be built in the woods. But in a way, as I said, like the idea of uh, utilizing nature to dialogue, uh, to create and to pose uh, the starting point of a question, uh, allows, you, allows me also to understand or to think that architecture is also a language, that architecture is used in this case to start a conversation, and that com this conversation is going to unfold through the years because nature changes, and through the season because nature changes through it. No? Architecture for me, it's, uh, it's not, cannot be completely called architecture if it's not built. I do think it's important to theorize architecture, to understand architecture, to draw it, to model it, to uh, in research it, to talk about it. But I think that it doesn't, it doesn't become architecture until it's built and occupied. So in this case, we were approached by the client uh, to ask us by, for a building that would um, be built in a description that she did of a house, a weekend house in, uh, in the shores of a lake. That would, in her description, in my head, when she was des describing it, it added like 300 meters, square meters. And then she described her wishes of a really double height space, an open kitchen, a really luxurious space. And then she said, at the end of the meeting, she said, oh, by the way, I only have 100,000 euros to build it. And we're like, ooh. So she left and I thought, we have to tell her that she needs to increase the budget in double or she needs to decrease the square meters in half, her ambition in half. And almost when I was going to do the call, I thought, well, then she's going to call a local contractor and we're not going to be able to do architecture. She's going to do an ugly house. Well, for me, it was, in my thought, it was ugly. <laughs> and we... And then we're going to fail. So we really, be, we really have to do architecture under the condition that it's, it's there. So the conditions is she wants a house that big, that ambitious, and she has that money. So we have to find a way to do it. And uh, so we started uh, the, the project not thinking on a, on a square meter operation, on a aesthetic operation. We started thinking what would be the really nice material that would allow us to do a house with this amount of money. So we thought of the, of the earth of the site. Definitely that was the most obvious Think, way of thinking. We tested the earth. The earth was good for us. So we started thinking uh, in a project that we uh, needed to design within the conditions, the normal conditions of the usage of the earth. We couldn't play with the earth because obviously that would, uh, uh, would bring us to more ex expenses. So we used the earth to think that we could do the structure, we understood that we needed to create models of 60 centimeters. And then we did it, only these two blocks, two squares, um, crossed uh, on other two. And we, uh, with the public space crossing them, the private being those two squares, and very simple gestures and using these uh, walls or this earth to become everything again. What I say, they are the um, uh, aesthetic definition, the structure definition, the insulation definition, and they become everything. They, uh, they allow us to become everything and in this way also to, be, to arrive to the budget. We decided also to use kind of a small pigment that would allow us to give scale to the building. So you, as human, can relate into the, the, the building in a, in a more direct relationship by playing with the colors. And then, uh, and then the scale will increase through the, through the height and the colors would disappear. The, 
the possibilities of the material were really enormous and were really allowing us to, to, to arrive to, to the definition of the ambitions of the project and the ambitions of the, of the, of the client, the ambition of the client. Definitely we, suc we succeeded because now we have a client, this same client, we're doing her private house in Guadalajara. No? Um, by understanding architecture as a gesture that allows you to probably pilgrim through nature, we were asked to design a house in a project in the north of Catalonia. Um, uh, half a country, half a state, <laughs> undefined at this moment, um, and that the, 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 the place is a very beautiful forest where um, some ar other architects are also designing a house. It's called uh, Solo Houses. Uh, two houses are already built by Petro von Erichhausen and by um, Office from Belgium. And we were also called to do a project. And our first approach was the idea of creating a structure that would allow you to promenade the landscape, to enjoy the landscape in different sections, in different possibilities, but also that would allow you to live in it. No? Probably, fortunately, it was not accepted by the, by the major of the town. And we were asked to do another project. And we decided to use the same strategy of having the possible, of allowing you, of creating a structure that would allow you to, in, to promenade the landscape, to promenade the landscape in different possibilities, in different heights. But by this new uh, idea, uh, by, by this new proposal that we needed to do, also we were thinking that we needed to allow the, 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 the architecture to, 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 to discover the whole site. So, um, with the idea of, uh, of architecture being only the promoter or the beginner of this dialogue, we decided to create a module that would multiply itself to create different spaces, but not to direct the spaces, just to pose space that can be used by the users uh, in any way. No? So we define those spaces through scale and shape, and by posing them in different parts of the landscape, but not directing them as this is a room and this is a bathroom. It's just uh, any possibilities are there of this becoming anything. So this structure can be used as separate rooms, as one room, as one structure become one family structure and the rest more open, as uh, leisure spaces or private spaces, depending also on your wishes, but on the uh, uh, and on your references and your possibilities, because we think every human is different, and we cannot create structure for every human because we are just one human being, or maybe a collective, but not enough uh, to think on the other. And this is where I come back to the first idea of becoming the other, and just posing something that we think is beautiful, but that the person could use as whatever, no? as, uh, as something that uh, allows this interaction or this possibility of the other to really uh, interact and transform this space. No? This is something that has allowed us to think really further, and that has allowed us to think that um, we can act differently. No? Normally, we get a, a proposal uh, or a request for a project as architects, and we were, we were asked to fulfill square meters and rooms. So you get a proposal of a project, and you get these numbers. No? Normally, you get that you need to do a house of 300 square meters with three rooms, three bedrooms, one living room, one kitchen kitchen, two bathrooms, blah, blah, blah. And then you need to do two parking spaces. And by code, you need to uh, fulfill this height and this size and blah, blah, blah. And that's a mathematic operation that I think it doesn't bring out nothing and that it's really suppressing the way we do architecture. So this is why we started to think that we could do architecture from a different point, although we need to fulfill all those things at the end because otherwise it cannot be built. We definitely need to start with a different idea. And in this case of this project, we were asked to do a house that allow allows 
the new way of living, which I don't think it's new. I think it's just been existing there, but now we think it's new, uh, which is living and working um, and having children at the same time. It's in Germany, in the Lake Ederse, uh, and this is where we were asked to do this house. Um, so they obviously gave us a brief with you needed to be to do three rooms and two bathrooms and X amount of square meters. And we started thinking, why don't we define the spaces through activities and emotions instead of square meters? And why don't we define those spaces in the way we see them? How do we see them? And we created this chart to understand those activities and those emotions that we think that are important to promote in a space. And then we chose those spaces who really, we really think they can create a living in general. We chose six spaces. We... Um, and mark those spaces that we think the, that they, they do that. Then we collage uh, those six different spaces separately. So uh, we started doing a space that promotes really the relationship between the neighborhood, the community, and the, the family that lives there. A space that promotes more the individually, individual or more family leisure life. A space that promotes more the life in, within the space, but within the family, but in a more relaxed way. Or a space that is protected internally, but has the views to the exterior, but allows to have these um, uh, more uh, interpersonal spaces. Or spaces that promote more the internal uh, uh, activities, uh, private activities. And then we collage them all together, and this is how we started the design. So instead of starting really with square meters, we started with ideas, we started with sensations, we started with activities, with emotions. We graphic them and then we put them into a, a paper together and this is how we were able to understand our design. And by, by then applying all the rules that we had to follow, we created the house. No? So the combination of both allowed us to arrive to the design. Um, which we finally presented uh, in a way that has all the six spaces and that becomes a house. No? And this way of thinking has allowed us to think further in a project that I'm going to present very briefly that we're doing in San Francisco. San Francisco is a city that has been really um, oppressing the poor by gentrifying areas that were normally occupied by, by diverse uh, population. It has gentrified the thing as much as not giving transport to anybody but the people that work in these tech companies. Um, the area where we are acting has a very high risk of gentrification. Uh, it's, it's a former uh, industrial area. And this industry uh, it obviously is now gone. It's, uh, it's taken outside of San Francisco. So all these beautiful sites are, uh, are there uh, for us to work. So that, that was a former power plant and it, all, it still has um, um, a, a substation, an electrical substation. So the first task for us was to create a new substation here, to move it here. And then when this site is free, to create a master plan of something that can happen there. So the first thing we did is we designed the substation here as an iconic space that would allow also a public space to happen. And the second move we did, uh, we did, we're doing now is to, to program this new site. So the company who hired us had been acting with the community since long. So the community has been invited to the site to think what can be done in this place. So we already had like a very intense mixed use program that the community wanted. So we knew that the mixity would be something that it was important. And again, we graphic that, we uh, collaged it, we understand that the industrial identity needs to be present, uh, but we need to create a habitat. So how to create a habitat there? We started thinking that uh, we needed to create a set of relationships again, like at, uh, the other two we did. How to combine the past, the industry, with the new community future? What is those four things that we think are the uh, that create a habitat? 
uh, the human needs to have a living space, the human needs to learn things, the new human needs to produce things, and need to really have health and be, 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 str uh, be strong for living. So what are those programs? And those programs, what do they mean in terms of physical spaces? How can they be combined? And then how they can be in a space? But then we ended up with a problem, no? How are we going now to design? Okay, now we could have the combination of spaces. How are we going to design? So we created a very complicated chart that we tested in numbers, and I'm not going to go into it because I can speak for three hours about this project. But um, by creating these um, perfect, and by perfect I said only to our standards, to our own uh, individual classification mixture of program, we started to think that we could then do a different thing. But when we started designing, we finally found that the things that we were doing were exactly the same as we started with square meters and with parking lot. So we created a new tool of testing our own idea and we tested it, we saw which one failed the least, and then we started to creating gestures that would really go towards our ideal of habitability, no? And this is how we started then creating these gestures and these possibilities, and we're there now. We haven't finished this project, but I wanted to show it to you because we have been working two years on it, and the client has really allowed us to go further because we convinced them that in order to create a habitat, we needed to match their numbers, we needed to match their finances, we needed to match their codes, but we needed to start designing from a different point of view, otherwise we wouldn't create a different place. And that's how they're really allowing us to, to think that there's a different way of starting to design. And it doesn't matter if we don't arrive here so quickly, but we're going to do something really different, no? So we're there now. We're not done. We don't know where this is going to take us, but we are. We're working really on it, no? I'm just going to show very quickly another project that we did of a house that is 43 square meters. It's built with uh, six between 600 and 8,000 euros. It is allowable to become self-built. It is in a program of houses that they're completely set and they don't have any possibilities. So we said we're only going to do it if it has more space, it, it allows more adaptability, and it allows more flexibility than all of these. We found that the collective um, mind of all the people and the landscape of Mexico is built like this, only concrete blocks with exposed steel bars. We call them the steel bars of the, um, of the hope hope steel bars. So we decided to follow the idea of doing a house that looks like a house, and this is something that we got out from uh, all the interviews we did. We did almost 2,000 interviews. That would be modular, so it had allowed to be flexible in terms of growing and also in terms of definition. That it would, in this case, then would allow us to combine a more permanent material with a more temporary material, but that will also allow several uses and several possibilities, no? So this house can be built in the north of the country in a weather that is not so, that is more extreme, or in the jungle, that it's a weather that is more tropical, no? That has uses of living, but also can have uses of, uh, of different uses. These people use their houses to, to, uh, to sell things, to produce things, to sell them, to keep them uh, of many things, no? So in a way to create a space that really uh, is flexible, is, is durable, but it's growable, no? We did two, two prototypes. We presented one in the Chicago Biennial, and then we built 23 of those houses that are already intervened, and they're already uh, giving more possibilities to the neighbors that the, the houses that they had before, no? The houses that they had before were built with the same amount of money, with the same space, uh, with the same program, but we created something that is really doubling the space, no? And I'm skipping this um, next part of the project because otherwise we're never going to finish and I would like to allow you some questions. And I will go back to the last end uh, of the presentation. We are uh, finishing this week three buildings in Lyon, 
uh, Lyon La Confluence. We were invited by Herzog and Demeron, who did the master plan for this area for phase two and phase three of Lyon. The first ilot was uh, designed um, by Herzog and Emeron with uh, 10 different architects. The developer chose three architects uh, from abroad and one architect from, uh, from Lyon. The main tower is done by Herzog and Emeron and we were able to do three buildings, two of um, social housing, one of uh, housing that it's more free for the, for the free market. And we decided to create three buildings that are, uh, well, they, we were asked to do three different buildings, which that was difficult for us. And now I think that we need to create something that is less problematic for an, for an office. As I said, one office cannot solve all the problems in one. So we did three different buildings, and our main strategy was that, uh, in a way, the three buildings transform into in each other and give information to the next one. No? So the first one is very regular. It just changes in very slightly, and if you look closely, in the sizes of the windows from the bottom to the top. The next one is a, a building that has a social housing, so it, it copies a little bit the rhythm of the lodges and the windows, but it transforms into different types because we wanted to have different uh, buildings. And then this one that takes completely the idea of uh, becoming something different, every apartment is different, every apartment is new, and nothing is equal. No? And finally, to end, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit on what uh, is really taking us, uh, uh, it's really taking our time. Uh, we have a very unfortunate event, uh, two events, um, the past September, which were two earthquakes that affected immensely the territory in Mexico. So almost nobody understands, but 34% of the territory was uh, affected by two earthquakes, one the 7th of September and one the 19th of September. These two earthquakes um, damaged 30% of the territory. 500,000 houses are in the floor, 14,000 schools are in the floor, and the problem is really, really major. The problem, I think, is that there has never been in history uh, one na uh, natural disaster that has destroyed this amount of territory in a country with this completely disconnected in terms of geographically, politically, culturally, these communities, uh, most uh, half of them don't speak Spanish. Um, there are small communities uh, that have almost their economies collapsed by this uh, situation, 600 communities, uh, and that they're really nice little towns that they looked like this, that they're now like this, and they really, with the possibilities that the government has now, can end up being like this. So we're really afraid and we really don't want this to happen. And we're acting, we ha we're 400 architects all together, going into towns, understanding every town, talking to every family, so you can imagine how difficult this is, but to understand how we can rebuild individually and not do just one massive uh, reconstruction. This is really a hard work. It's a, it's a work that it has reunited so many offices that we're probably not even talking to each other, but that really needs our help and uh, of everyone. And so this is now taking us almost all our time. And with that, I think I end up uh, leaving the, the time that is best to, to questions and comments and whatever. Thank you very much. Alors merci beaucoup pour cette présentation magnifique qui montre la, la richesse de ton approche et puis euh, cette liberté que tu as sur euh, tous les projets. Euh, je voulais savoir s'il si, euh, y avait des questions euh, dans la salle. S'il y a des questions ou pas. C'est très compliqué de... <rire> Vous pouvez les poser les questions en français. Hein. J'ai bien compris le français. Et, et alors, autrement, s'il n'y a pas de questions, peut-être. S'il y a une question. Okay. Okay. 
Euh, on m'entend là Non, 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 je ne sais pas. Ok. Euh, tout d'abord, bueno, gracias, antes que nada, soy mexicano. Hola. <laughs> Et que te hablo en espagnol, <laughs> igual. Pero, uh, creo que entendí que entiendes bien francés, así para que todos entiendan. Ok. Alors, uh, la question c'est. Vu que je suis mexicain et que j'ai vécu 22 ans de ma vie là-bas, j'aimerais bien savoir qu'est-ce qu que vous en pensez euh, sur la, la, la perte d'identité architecturale du Mexique, euh, comme dans do, ça se passe dans d'autres pays. Enfin, vu que vous êtes une architecte, euh, euh, j'ai vu quelques de vos travaux. Et je, je vous trouve assez international, tout comme Monsieur euh, euh, Coulon a dit au début de la conférence. Euh, vous êtes très international, mais, mais aussi très local euh, quand il s'agit de travailler au Mexique. Euh, J'aimerais bien, qu'est-ce que vous en pensez, enfin, sur la perte juste de l'identité, voilà. Enfin, dès que tout ça devient la même chose, euh, puisque voilà. Je me sens contrarié, vu que mon pays, et je ne parle pas que de mon pays, chaque pays est différent et très particulier, mais mon pays, il est quand même <rire> mon pays, quoi. <rire> like... <rire> oui, je pense, et corrigez-moi si j'ai mal compris votre question, mais je pense que j'ai compris. Je pense que l'une des choses vraiment damagées qui ont été happen in Mexico is the production of social housing. And this has really been very important because there's 11 million houses like these ones in, in the country that are produced just in, in, in mass and that have the government thought that that was the solution for the complex problems of housing all the people that are in our country. And uh, unfortunately, by trying to create the ideal of life. What they created is completely the loss of identity by understanding that a house can give uh, these things to a person, but a house that it's far from the city centers, a house that it's 43 square meters, that has really no possibilities of giving identity to no one, and that uh, really even, I'm gonna, by even thinking that if you paint them in rainbow colors, they would be really giving identity. What only, give, what only happens is taking all the identity away from these people, because these people become a number. So if you think 11 million people live in these type of houses, even if you think that this is a beautiful landscape, and why would this be wrong? It's because these houses are 43 square meters. They are like three hours away from the works, from the jobs, from the city centers. People have no cars, no transport, no possibilities of getting there. And they really have also no possibilities of developing a life there. And this is 11 million people. So I think that the loss of identity in this case Uh, it's really been increased by this production of this housing and that even though people try very hard to create their own identity in, within these walls uh, it's not easy no? so I think that the problem is the combination of a bad um, uh, uh, government very corrupt government uh, with very bad intentions and the combination of the necessity of this society to have really housing and, and uh, the, the legal um, article in our constitution that says that the government has to produce housing for the people. So these three things all together have created these in the past years that have uh, really killed identity in our country in a very big way. Thank you, I think that's an interesting question. I was wondering when I saw your lecture, Um, what's the role of vernacular architecture? What's the role of Mexican vernacular architecture for you? And what does make you Mexican? I do think that uh, what makes me Mexican is to think that we need to build with the minimum. 
So we really think that we need to take advantage of every single thing that we use. Uh, meaning what I show in, in our projects, even though we have enormous budgets or very little budgets, we, also, we only use a material that would allow us to create everything, the space, the expression of it. And we rely, we rely on that and we don't rely on detail. We cannot rely on detail because, first of all, we don't have the hand labor, the specialized hand labor that would allow us to create these very beautiful details as you do here, for example, in, more in Switzerland, I have to say, but, I, <laughs> but also in France, way more than in Mexico. In Mexico, we have to rely in the identity of the architecture more than in the detailing of the architecture. No? So I think that that uh, classifies me <laughs> as, a, as a Mexican architect because I, my architecture relies on the definition of the space rather than the small detailing of it, no? And that the, that this, the, the space is defined by its materiality uh, by one gesture, no? One single gesture that would allow you to really do something because otherwise it fails, no? I think that is why these things fail. Is there some historical um, vernacular Mexican architecture which is preserved and do you, can you relate to it? I think it has the same principles. I think they are vernacular architecture in Mexico relates exactly on that, you know, on one very important gesture, for example, color. No? Some of them are color, some of them are materiality, some of them are space, like Mayan architecture. It's really interesting how they rely on the definition of the space, which is one single circular space. Or uh, the, in Oaxaca, the architecture relies really in the color of the architecture, so it, it is a box. But it's really colorful and really open, for example, to, this, to, the, to the community life, which doesn't happen here, although they're painted in colors. Um, or the architecture more in the north, which depends, really relies on the materiality, no? In the earth or, in the, or even in the, in the wood that is used to define the space, no? So it really relies on, uh, on one gesture that becomes everything that does the architecture what it does. Et alors moi j'ai pas de questions mais j'ai une bonne nouvelle pour toi et pour Strasbourg aussi puisque en fait Tatiana était venue pour présenter un concours qu'on a fait tous les trois et puis on a appris que on l'avait gagné voilà alors je pense So I really will not forget tonight ever. Thank you for sharing it with me. <laughs> I, and I will be here more often. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't at a conference. It was impossible to come. Uh, but uh, you use insulation for your houses because it's very cold in uh, Mexico. Uh, it's 2,000 uh, in altitude. Yes. You, you use uh, isolation. What, what kind of isolation? No, Mexico City has actually the perfect temperature. Although it's very high, we're in the tropics. Ah, so yes. uh, temperature is really nice. Ah, yes. It Mexico. never is too hot, never too cold. Ah, yes. We have a beautiful temperature, which is changing. The weather of the world is changing, unfortunately. So it's becoming hotter and colder. But normally, the... The temperature is very mild, so we are able to use, uh, as again, one gesture to help us to become everything. So insulation and, and everything comes in one single structure because we also need to economize the means. We don't have a big economy, mm -hmm. so we need to yes, work with these things. Mm -hmm. I love your color you use, like Baragan. <laughs> <laughs> Te remercier. Merci, Merci. beaucoup.